We're going to start this morning uh, by continuing on in our series called Created for Significance. And today I want to focus on uh, the fact that God has distinguished you for significance. He's distinguished me for significance. He's distinguished us as his people for significance. I want to ask you a question this morning, and, and this is not a question you're going to have enough time to process during this part of the service, but it is a question I would encourage you to go home and process, a question I would encourage you to think about this week and then do something with. And the question is, well, before I get to the question, let me ask you this. How many of you have somebody in your life that you love? Okay, good. Everybody? How many of you have somebody in your life that you know, without a shadow of a doubt, loves you? Okay, good. So we all know what it's like to love someone and to be, to be loved. So here's the question I, I would ask you to process this week. Thinking about those people that you love, what would be the top things, maybe the top three or four, five, six, maybe the top ten if you want to go that far, the top ten things you would tell that person or those people today if you knew that today was going to be your last opportunity to tell them anything? What would be the top few things on your mind, on your heart, that you would, you would share with them if you knew this was going to be your last opportunity to share anything with them? And again, I know that's far too big of a question for you to process completely and fully right now, but it's a question I think we should think about. It's a question I would encourage you to consider, a question I would encourage you to to process. And then I would say, once you come up with those things, I would encourage you to go ahead and share those things with those people. Because Proverbs 27.1 says, don't boast about tomorrow, for you don't know what a day might bring, what a day might hold. So if you have something important on your mind and on your heart, go ahead and say it. Go ahead and tell somebody about it. I do indeed care about you. I love this church. It's in part why we've stayed here as long as we have. We've had opportunities to go other places and to do other things and to serve elsewhere in the kingdom of God. But we have chosen to stay here because we love you. We love this church. And there are five important things that I want to share with you today. And please know at the end of the sermon does not come my resignation. It's just... These are the things that the Lord laid on my heart today, and I think they're a great reminder for us as a church. I think they're a great encouragement for us as a church, and um, I think they're important as we talk about how God has distinguished us for significance. We've talked about how he's designed us, and we've talked about how he has destined us for significance, and last week we talked about how he delivered us for significance, but today let's focus in on how God has set us apart and distinguished us, made us different than everybody else for significance. We are not like the rest of the world. How many of you know what this is? Puzzle piece, that's right. If you can't see it, it's, it's a puzzle piece. It's a big one, um, so hopefully you could see it. How many of you have ever done a puzzle? How many of you have ever got to the end of the puzzle and figured out you were missing a few of the pieces? <laughs> Isn't that frustrating? It is so frustrating to get to the end of a puzzle and realize that somehow, somewhere along the way, a few pieces of that puzzle got removed, or maybe got shuffled under the table, or maybe got thrown away because they got left out last time somebody put the puzzle together. But for whatever reason, you've spent all that time putting together that puzzle, and you get to the end, and you're missing a few of the pieces. And even though you can see the picture, and you can look at the front of the box and go, wow, I got pretty close. It's, it's just frustrating whenever you're missing the puzzle pieces to make the picture complete. Today, as we talk about God distinguishing us for significance, I want, I want you to realize something. I want you to realize that you are a puzzle piece in the economy of God. You, you are a piece of the puzzle that makes up the great ta ta tapestry of his kingdom. And, and when we start removing pieces or we remove ourselves or we go off and hide or 
or we just choose not to be a part of the picture anymore, whatever the case may be, it becomes frustrating to everybody in the family of God because the puzzle isn't necessarily complete. And you're a unique piece. I mean, this piece will only fit one place in that puzzle. There's no other piece in the entire box of puzzle pieces that's back here in the back. There's no other piece just like this piece. There's no other piece that can go in the spot this piece goes. And if God has brought you here to this church at this time in history, he's done that. He's distinguished you. He's made you unique, and he's made you a part of the puzzle. He's made you one of the pieces. And there's nobody else like you. There's nobody else exactly with your gifts and your talents and your temperaments and, and, and the unique things that God has put into you that he wants to use here through this church, through you. And when we all come together and we put all of our pieces in the right place, that's when something beautiful is created for the kingdom and for the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 will be our text for today. I want to read it to you and then we'll dissect it. We'll spend the majority, the great majority of our time in verse 9. But here's what it says. But you, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now that's where we're going to spend the majority of our time today, but the key to understanding verse 9 is in verse 10. It says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people, you had not received mercy, but now, now you have. You have received mercy. The big idea for today is this, God's mercy makes all the difference. God's mercy makes all the difference. For some of you right now, that is the puzzle piece in your life that's missing. You have not accepted the mercy of God. You, you have not been redeemed by the blood of Jesus and experienced the love and the grace and the mercy of the Lord. And God's mercy makes all the difference. Nothing in verse 9 works without the mercy we find in verse 10. The Lord has five encouraging points for us today, but they are contingent upon the mercy of God being present in your life. That's why I'll tell you multiple times as we move through the text today that God's mercy makes all the difference. I told you a moment ago I love this church. Now please hear me, when I say that, I, I want you to understand very clearly today what I'm saying. I'm not saying I love my job. There are plenty of days I don't like my job. I, I'm not saying I, I love these buildings. I'm not saying I love our programs or our staff. I'm, I'm not saying I love our campus or our property. When I say I love this church, I mean that I love you. I love the people who make up this church. The most common Greek word in the New Testament for church is the word ekklesia. The word does not mean building. It doesn't mean programs. It certainly does not mean job. It doesn't mean campus. The word means a called out assembly of people. It refers to those who have been distinguished, those who have been called out of the world by the mercy of God and put into a royal position. Those who are different from everybody else thanks to the cross of Christ and the mercy of God because God's mercy makes all the difference. Five things here in our text, four in verse nine and one in verse 10 that distinguish us for significance. The first can be described with the word preservation. Preservation, point number one, verse nine starts with these words, but you are a chosen race. The word here, but, is there to offer a contrast. A contrast between what has been in the previous verses and what he is now transitioning to. A contrast between unbelievers and believers. A contrast between sinners and saints. A contrast between those who have not and those who have been redeemed. 
And we're reminded that those who are saved by the mercy of God, those who are saved by the work of God, those who are saved by the power of God, are also set apart and distinguished by God. They are different. They are a chosen race. Now, I don't particularly like the word race here in this context. The Greek word in the Greek text is the word genos. It can mean race, but it can also mean nation or generation or countrymen. It's, a, it, it's really the idea of something bigger than what we think of as, as race. Our concept of race today is heavily weighted to the idea of the color of one's skin, but what's being said here has nothing to do with the color of your skin. It has everything to do with being chosen by God and receiving the mercy of God in your life. The point here is that you and I arrived at this royal position. We received this distinguished place because of God's mercy, not our merit, because of God's mercy, not our activity, because of God's mercy, not our will. One commentator said it like this. He said, the title chosen people stresses God's loving initiative in bringing the church, the ecclesia, the people, to himself. And church, what God chooses, he protects and he preserves. As the chosen people of God, we are promised both earthly and eternal preservation because of our distinguished royal position. I know that God protects and preserves his children. The Bible says we are heirs to his kingdom. We are his people. We are his church. Jesus says this in John 17, 14 through 16. He says, I have given them, speaking of his people, the church, I have given them your word and the world hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. They're different than the world. He says, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. They're different. They're distinguished. And he's praying for the preservation, the protection of us, the saints. In Matthew 16, Jesus says not even the gates of hell can overpower his church. He says, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. Paul wrote these words to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 3. In addition, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people, for not all have faith. There are people out there that are different from us who don't have faith. He says, but the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. He will protect you and preserve you. Paul understood that the people of the church were distinguished. They were different from those outside of the faith. He states it in many places throughout the New Testament that he knows that God will also take care of his people, that God will protect and preserve his church. So church, that's good news for us this morning, amen? If you are a part of God's church, then you are a chosen people, and you're safe. No matter what life may throw at you, no matter what the world may come at you with, you, you are safe. Consider the words of Christ in John chapter 10. <clears throat> but you don't believe because you're not of my sheep. My sheep, he says, this is Jesus, hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And then he says, no one will snatch them out of my hand. He says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. In other words, they're safe because my daddy is a big, big God. He says, no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. So this is why I'm telling you God's mercy makes all of the difference because it is where the source of our protection and preservation as a distinguished people comes from. 
We are distinguished for significance by the mercy of God, and that means we are granted the preservation of our lives and our souls for all eternity. God's mercy makes all the difference. Number two is the word priesthood. Verse 9, as you continue, but you are a chosen race. He says a royal priesthood and a holy nation. Now we could take 30 minutes to dive into all of what that means, but we don't have that kind of time this morning. But here's what I will say about it. A royal priesthood and a holy nation, that's, that's significant and that shows again that we are distinguished. A royal priesthood and a holy nation. Can you just let that sink in for a minute? A royal priesthood. A holy nation. When you woke up this morning, is that how you felt? Like a royal priesthood? Like you were a part of a holy nation? When you were having that bad day at work this week, or that bad day with your kids, or that bad day in your own head. Is that how you felt? That like you were a royal priesthood, a holy nation? That's how you should have felt. Because that's who you are. And you are that not because of who you are, you are that because of who he is. You are a royal priesthood and a chosen nation not because of what you have done, but because of what he did. You you are a royal priesthood and a holy nation, not because of where you've been, but because he went to Calvary and died for you. It's why I'm telling you again, God's mercy makes all the difference. Peter Peter talks about this in verses 4 and 5, up just above our main text for today, if you want to read it with me. Jump up to verse 4 in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by people, but chosen and honored by God, you yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built. Are being built to be a holy priesthood. To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This is a whole lot like, this language is a whole lot like what Moses told the Israelites back in Exodus chapter 19. We'll read it for some context, starting in verse 5, Exodus 19, where Moses says, Now, if you will carefully listen to me and keep my covenant, you will be my own possession out of all the peoples. Although the whole earth is mine, and you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites. That was tied to an Old Testament covenant. And our royal priesthood and our becoming a holy nation is tied to the mercy of God. If you want to jump to the end of the book, Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, it says this, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us, and has set us free from our sins by his blood. And then look at verse 6. And made us, he made us a kingdom. A kingdom of what? Priests to his God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now here's where we could take 30 minutes and talk about what a priest is and what that means and all the nuances of being a priest. But I don't want you to get lost in all of that this morning. I want you just to start thinking of yourself this way, reminding yourself and remembering that you are indeed what the Bible says you are. You're not the same as everybody else, church. This is why we don't think the same. People say, I don't know why they don't think like me. I'll tell you why they don't think like you. They're not a part of the kingdom you're a part of. This is why we don't act the same. This is why we don't talk the same. This is why we don't value the same things that people of the world's kingdom value. This is why we don't chase the same stuff. This is why we don't see things the same way. And we never will, by the way. Church, this is why we don't grieve the same way as non-believers. Because we're not the same. 
We're set apart. We're a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. At least when we act like it. And that's really the problem, isn't it, church? Isn't that really the problem? And that's why I don't want us to get lost in the nuance of all of what it means. I want us just to start acting like who we are. See, most of us, we don't act like royal priests. We don't act like we're a part of a holy nation set apart by the God of the universe. But we should, because that's what God has done. He has distinguished us for significance. We, we didn't do it. We didn't distinguish ourselves. He did it. And it's a great reminder as we prepare to enter into a new week. I, I want to encourage you as you're walking into this new week to just be who God created you to be, a royal priest, a holy nation. I want you to wake up every morning and go, praise God, I'm a part of a holy nation. When you're having your worst day, you're still God's child. You're still set apart. You're still destined and delivered and distinguished for significance. The design that God has given your life, as we talked about in week one of this series, is no different on your worst day. You're still designed for significance. Because God's mercy is what makes all the difference. His mercy preserves us, and it's his mercy that makes us into a royal priesthood and a holy nation. It's nothing we did. It's his mercy. It's his grace. It's God, not us. Number three, it's the word possession. Possession, you and I are set apart, distinguished by God for significance. We are his possession. The fact that he claims us as his possession is yet another great reminder that he has distinguished us for significance. The fact that he would claim you as his possession should make you want to shout for joy and say amen because that's a big deal when God is claiming you. How significant is that, y'all, that God set you apart and distinguished you for significance. Look at verse 9 again. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession. When God called your name and set you apart, he took possession of your life. He adopted you into his family as we mentioned last week, he transferred you from the jurisdiction of the devil and put you in the jurisdiction of his kingdom. He set you apart. He made you completely different. The old was gone. The new has come. Paul makes this point over and over in all kinds of different ways throughout the New Testament. Like in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. And he says, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. In other words, I'm no longer my own possession. I belong to God. I belong to Jesus because I'm saved. He says, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. He knew exactly where this came from. I don't set aside the grace of God for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Now, I don't know if you guys have noticed this or not in your lives, but I have noticed a pattern in my own life. I've noticed something significant in my life. When I'm living my life in submission to God, when I'm living my life in submission to his word and to his will and to his ways, when I'm living my life in full recognition of the fact that my life is not mine, it doesn't belong to me, it's not mine to manage because I'm his possession, I belong to the king, I'm a servant of the king. When I'm in that mindset and I'm living my life in that way and I have that heart that Paul talks about here where I say, I'm, I no longer live but Christ lives in me. When I'm living, living as if I am the sole possession of the king of kings and the Lord of lords, Things seem to go much, 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 much better than whenever I take control of it 
and act like I'm my own personal possession. You see, when you come into the kingdom, church, you come in on your knees. Everybody comes in the same way. Nobody comes in with their head held high, full of pride. Nobody comes in saying, look at me and how good I am. We all come in with our heads bowed low, down on our knees, our face in the dirt, begging for forgiveness. You come into the kingdom and you submit your life from day one to Christ, the king of the kingdom. And you in that moment become possession of him, the possession of him. That's why so many of Paul's letters start like this, Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, he says, a servant of Christ Jesus called an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. He knew exactly who he was. He was God's servant, God's slave. 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God, not by his smarts, not by his will, not by his education, by the command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. He knew he had a commander. He knew he had a king. He knew he had to live his life in submission to that king. Others like Peter say things like this in 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, he says, I'm a servant first. He knew his place. He knew where he was. He knew what it meant to be set apart and distinguished by the mercy of God. He knew that made him a servant, a slave to Christ. He goes on to say, to those who have received faith equal to ours through the righteousness of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. He knew it wasn't going to come from him. He knew it was God's mercy that would bring it to him just like it, brought it had brought it to him. There's so many other verses we could look at. Romans 6.20 is another one that came to mind. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free with regard to righteousness. So what fruit was produced then from the things you are now ashamed of? The outcome of those things is death. But now, he says, something's different. <laughs> You've been distinguished. He says, since you have been set free from sin and have become enslaved to God, enslaved, a servant of God, you have your fruit, which results in the sanctification and the outcome is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Church, if I could just put this plainly and bluntly, you cannot be set free from your sins and keep possession of your life. That is an impossibility. Because repentance is dying to yourself and living for God and his kingdom and recognizing that you are no longer your own possession, but you are his. Jesus said it like this in Luke 9, 23 and 24. Then he said to them all, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will save it. You see, if, if you're saved, if you are his, if you are redeemed... That means you're his possession. You belong to him. You're his servant. Because he is your king. God's mercy makes all the difference. There's one last thing here in verse 9 that we need to discuss before we move to verse 10. And that is the word purpose. We're set apart and we're distinguished for a purpose. We're not just different from everybody else. We're, we're set apart and distinguished for a purpose. There's significance in our calling to come to Christ beyond just us getting to go to heaven. There's significance in our salvation because with it comes a great purpose even while we're here on earth. Look at the final part of verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that 
You may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Everything we've talked about so far leads us here to our purpose. We can't miss this now. I mean, we can't skip over this. We, we must not our, uh, abandon our pursuit of God here, just short of our purpose. God set us apart. God distinguished us for a purpose. We're supposed to proclaim, church, his praises with our lives. Praises here, this word, could also be translated Eminent qualities or excellencies or virtues or character. In other words, we're just supposed to tell people about who God is. We're supposed to tell people about how great God is. God has distinguished us. He set us apart as his church through his mercy to tell the world of his greatness. That we as the church would be so bold and so daring that we would dare to tell everybody about the goodness of God. That we would tell them about his power and his grace. That we would tell them about his, his love and his justice. That we would tell the world about his works. That we would tell the world about his cross and his gospel. That God would be such a big part of our lives and he would so frequently be upon our lips and upon our actions that everybody would know we are his children. Can I ask you a question? Don't raise your hand. Do the people you work with know you're a believer? Do the people you live next to know you're a believer? Do the people you go to school with know you're a believer? Do, do the people you recreate with, play sports with, do your kids play sports with, do they know you're set apart by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Do the people you go to the beach with or the river with or the pool with or on vacation with, do, do they know you're a believer? Do the people you just casually hang out with to watch a game or visit on a Saturday night around a fire pit, do they all know you're a believer? Do they know? Some time ago, I was talking to a gentleman who has been going to our church for quite a while. He's been a friend of mine for much longer than he's been going to our church. I mean, he didn't just go to our church. He's, he served on teams here at our church. He's very regular at our church. And one day in our conversation, he was bragging to me about something that seemed very, very strange to me. He was talking about a conversation he had had with somebody at work, which then led that person to say something like this. This isn't an exact quote, but he was, he was excited about this. He was happy about this. As a part of that conversation, that person said, oh, I didn't know you were a Christian. And he, he thought that was a good thing. He thought that was a really good thing that he had lived his life straddling the fence so well that people couldn't even tell who he was. He thought that was really cool. The truth is, that's really sad. It's sad because after being saved and set apart by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to be a holy priest, a holy nation, after being distinguished by the King, after being pulled out of the pit and preserved and transferred into a royal priesthood, a holy nation, after becoming the very possession of God, Not a single person he worked with even knew about it. I said, man, that's funny. Doesn't sit right with me. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, do they know you love to fish? He said, yeah, they know I love to fish. They know I fish every Saturday. I talk about it all the time. 
Do they know who your favorite football team is? Well, yeah, everybody knows I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. They couldn't miss that. Do they know what political party you belong to? Well, absolutely they do, because I vote, and he goes on. So they know all these other things about you, but they don't know you're a child of God? They don't know you've been saved? They don't know that you're a part of God's kingdom? My friends, there's something wrong with that. Now, don't get too judgmental, because the reality is we could all do better in this area, couldn't we? I know I could. The Lord was convicting my heart of it this week. He was like, man, if you weren't a pastor, how many people would know? Yeah, they know because you're on Facebook, and you know, you've been the pastor here forever, but you know, they kind of automatically know, but are you, are you really living your life like people really know? Yeah. Yeah. We could all do better. Church, I'm just telling you, you are distinguished and you are set apart for a purpose. And that purpose is to tell everyone about how great God is. We don't need any more camouflage Christians in our culture. We got plenty. We got plenty of undercover Christians. We need people who have been transformed by God's mercy and who know it who know that God's mercy makes all the difference in their life. And so they keep their, they keep their lives positioned in a way that everybody knows it. They can't keep their mouth shut about it. Because when you have felt God's mercy, I don't know how you can keep quiet about it. I want to wrap up with this last one. It's short. Verse 10. It's the word People. Once you were not a people, it says, but now you are God's people, his possession. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. How amazing is that? You were not a people, but now you are. And you're not just a people. He says you're God's people. Church, we are distinguished We are set apart as the people of God. And that is significant. And it's all made possible by the mercy of God. It's only possible because of the Son of God dying on a cross for our sins because, again, God's mercy makes all the difference. If you're here right now or can hear my voice right now and you've never been so blessed as to experience the mercy of God in a life-changing, eternity-changing way, if you've never felt the full effect of his mercy upon your life as your sins get washed away and as your heart is cleansed, we want to give you the opportunity this morning to understand in a real way, to experience in a real way that the mercy of God makes all the difference. Because the Bible says if you repent, if you believe, if you confess, it says you will be saved. And you too will be set apart, distinguished by God for significance. But it's only possible by calling on Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You have to repent. You have to humble yourself before God. You have to believe. You have to confess. And then you will know that God's mercy makes all the difference. You've been wondering what the puzzle piece that's missing in your life is. I would submit to you today, it is the mercy of God. Come to the cross. Allow the Lord to put that last piece of the puzzle in. And you will experience a life that you never dreamed existed. Not because it will get perfect. Not because all your problems will go away but because God will be in it for the first time. And you'll see that God's mercy makes all the difference. Let's pray. If that's you and you want to call on Jesus, we're not going to ask you to raise a hand, walk an aisle, stand up. 
I'm just going to ask you to pray in the stillness of your heart, right there where you are. Repent of your sins, believe and confess this hour, and you will be saved. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would change me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would make me new. Forgive me of my sins and give me the great gift of eternal life. Lord, I thank you for your grace and for your mercy, for your love. for calling my name to set me apart, to make me a part of your church, your kingdom, for significance. Father, as we close today, we are reminded that all of these incredible things we've talked about today are not of us. They are not available to us because of what the world offers or because of what a a church organization offers, Lord, they are available to us only because of what the cross offers. They are available only because of what your mercy offers. And we are grateful, Lord, for your mercy, for your patience, for your love, for your willingness to pour your life out for each of us. And then to radically set us apart and distinguish us from everybody else as your people. Lord, my prayer this day is that we would just live like it. We would work like it. We would play like it. We would talk like it. We would just act like it. Lord, give us the courage and the boldness to do that. Father, help us to never forget that it's your mercy that makes all the difference. We love you. We thank you. We praise you this hour in Jesus' name. Amen.